Hi, I'm Les Kirkup. Welcome to this video on experimental methods for science and engineering students. In this and other videos in the series, we delve into the practices and methods that scientists and engineers adopt when they do experiments, which are applicable when you yourself carry out experiments. Progress in science and engineering relies heavily on accurate measurement using instruments. In this video, we'll consider the role of measurement and instruments in science and engineering. We begin by looking at a rather special instrument. This is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, otherwise known as LIGO, situated in Livingston, Louisiana. LIGO's purpose is to detect gravitational waves generated, for example, when two black holes collide. Gravitational waves are a prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Direct observation of such waves has been the ambition of several generations of scientists. LIGO detected gravitational waves in 2015. The detection was greeted with much excitement among scientists and was widely reported. Central to LIGO is an interferometer comprising many components, including a high power laser. A beam splitter splits the light from the laser, sending it along two mutually perpendicular paths. When a gravitational wave passes through the interferometer, the wave stretches the space along one path and squeezes the space along the other. The interferometer's role is to detect the extremely small difference in the paths taken by the light. Though that may sound reasonably straightforward, the detection is extremely challenging. It took teams of dedicated engineers and scientists decades to conceive, build and refine an instrument sensitive enough to detect the waves. It is still early days, but LIGO and similar observatories promise new insights into the working of the universe. LIGO is an example of big science that uses state-of-the-art technology to make measurements. We too can make measurements, though admittedly not of gravitational waves, using state-of-the-art technology. That technology resides in a smartphone. Smartphones contain sensors and other electronic components able to transform the phone into a powerful and versatile measuring instrument. There are apps for smartphones which tap into the onboard sensors, allowing for the measurement of quantities such as air pressure, magnetic field and acceleration. One such app is Toolbox. Let's explore one of the tools in Toolbox. Here the smartphone is acting as a decibel sound meter, which analyzes sound picked up by the smartphone's microphone. The same tool also determines the frequency of the sound. Let's see it in action. Here is the sound meter app. At the bottom you'll see the sound level measured in decibels. Towards the top of the screen, you'll see the frequency components in the sound. If I switch on an external tone, you'll see a peak quickly appear, and above that peak is a number, which is the frequency of the tone that's been generated. Let's explore an example illustrating how careful measurement led to an important discovery. This is Lord Raleigh. At the end of the 19th century, he was interested in measuring the density of gases which requires the measurement of mass of a known volume of gas. Here is a picture of the type of balance Raleigh used to measure the mass of gas trapped in a vessel of known volume. One of the gases he was interested in was nitrogen. Raleigh extracted nitrogen from the atmosphere and separately from nitric oxide. Expecting quite reasonably that the density of the nitrogen he calculated would be the same in both cases, he was much perplexed when it was not. He was so perplexed that he wrote to the editor of Nature. I am much puzzled by some re recent results as to the density of nitrogen and shall be obliged if any of your chemical readers can offer suggestions as to the cause. According to two methods of preparation, I obtain quite distinct values. The relative difference, amounting to about a thousandth part, is small in itself, but it lies entirely outside the errors of the experiment and can only be attributed to a variation in the character of the gas. The difference between the density values was small, and it must have been tempting to put the difference down to experimental error or the limitations of the measuring equipment he was using. Raleigh chose not to do that, but to probe the problem further. Raleigh made many careful measurements of the mass of gas he obtained from nitric oxide and that he obtained from air. In each case, the gas was trapped in a glass globe of known volume. Here are some of the data that Raleigh obtained. Masses plotted on the vertical axis 
and the source is shown on the horizontal axis. If the error bars indicating the uncertainty in measurement were of this size, then Raleigh would have been forgiven for dismissing the small difference in the masses. However, these were the sizes of the error bars. indicating that there was a real difference in the mass of the nitrogen collected from the two sources. The explanation for the difference in the masses lies in the fact that what Raleigh thought would be pure nitrogen derived from air was in fact nitrogen mixed with another until then unknown gas which was subsequently named argon. For the discovery of argon, Raleigh was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1904. The gravitational waves detected by LIGO in 2015 and the work of Raleigh more than 100 years before that teaches us two things. First, discoveries are often hard won, requiring patience, imagination and commitment to accurate and reproducible measurement. Second, ever-evolving instruments combined with the ingenuity and tenacity of scientists and engineers who de devise them continue to add to our understanding of both cosmic and terrestrial phenomena. We should step back for a moment. It was really the size of the error bars that convinced Raleigh that more investigation was required, but we didn't consider how those error bars were calculated. In another video, we'll meet that challenge head on of calculating the size of error bars. And more generally, we will consider how uncertainties in measured values are determined. Until then, goodbye for now.